Oh, hi, Craig. Hey, what's going on? Before we get to the movie, I want to talk about a book about a movie. It is called Once Upon a Time in Hollywood by Quentin Tarantino. A book that I have read. When I read the first chapter of this, uh -huh. which is the meeting between Rick Dalton and Marvin Schwartz, I was struck by how bad the writing was. Yes! You remember The Counselor? One of the best writers in the history of America. Cormac McCarthy writes a script. He doesn't know how Tr to write a movie. Truth has no temperature, yeah. Yes, and now we have the reverse happening, where one of the best screenwriters of all time tries to write a book. I figured out what he's doing. Mm -hmm. It's intentional. Quentin Tarantino is all about pastiche. And so what I think he's doing is he's imitating these guys who in the 60s and 70s would write these quickie adaptations of blockbuster movies. Yes. That very stiff style of these these men who were craftsmen they knew where to put all the semicolons and the colons they could work fast but they were not artists in the least that's what i thought at first but then i read the rest of the book i haven't read a novelization of a book since i read the goonies back in 1980 <laughs> whatever i believe i read the novelization of the mm -hmm. 1989 batman i don't even know where to begin with this i wish i had my copy on me because it's the only book i've ever read where I was actually scratching out unnecessary lines. <laughs> I've never done that before in all my years as a reader. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm gonna spring one on you. It might be good, it might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to the basement. Isn't it rich? Sondheim is dead. Here I am left with this old fashioned song in my head. Hello there, folks. This is our final episode before Christmas, so we want to wish you a happy Christmas or whatever holiday you celebrate. Yeah. There is a director that we've talked about a lot on this show. Never been on the show before. Till tonight. He's made a lot of movies. And his movies tend to be either really good or really not good. Now, it's my understanding that the movie we're watching tonight is one of the really not good ones, but at least we get to watch Robert Altman I want you to bundle up in your warmest winter wear as you face the most dangerous game that is Quintet. What the what? <laughs> Released in 1979, Quintet stars B.B. Anderson, Fernando Rey, and basement alum Paul Newman. The majority of the movie was filmed on the site of Montreal's Expo 67 World's Fair. The snow is very real, and Altman had all of the sets kept at freezing temperatures, which I'm sure the cast and crew just loved. <laughs> Critics were not kind. Stanley Kaufman of the New Republic described Quintet as paralyzingly stupid. Let's see what Variety has to say about this film in their Variety uh, science fiction Wait, guide. this is a science fiction movie? Apparently it is. Robert Altman's latest impenetrable exercise in self-indulgence. Robert Altman's most stark and frightening film. Take that, Dr. T and the women. <laughs> your gift today is a game that will not endanger your life, and it might even give you a bit of the Christmas spirit. Every game is a weapon if you use it right. You've given me something similar to this in the past, but this looks like it would actually work, unlike the other one. I believe the other one was sci-fi themed, and this is Christmas themed. All right. Hey, speaking of which, this is the Christmas episode. Is this Christmas themed at all? It's or? winter themed. Winter themed. Nuclear winter. Oh. Probably. Probably, yes. Well, grab your bag of dice and meet us over at the old leather couch to play a game where the stakes are life and death, because the movie is Quintet. Zero points. Winter has come, and it's not going away. Dead trains, and these two. Essex and Vivia walk. They're walking over here, and they're walking over there. Hey, doggies. You're my favorite customer. <laughs> <laughs> they see a goose. Those things don't exist anymore. It's flying north. It's an idiot. Quinjet, the latest Marvel blockbuster about the Avengers plane. <laughs> He's the gas man. Da He's the gas man. Meanwhile, in the city. The loneliest number. They're playing this game called Quintet. For God's sake, will someone roll a natural 20 so the movie can get exciting? So it takes a nuclear winter to make Renaissance fashions come back in style. I can start dressing up like Thomas More as soon 
as the bombs fall. Or you can dress like a punk rocker if you live in Australia. Yes, that's right. Essex and Vivia arrive at the city. There are corpses lying around everywhere, and wild dogs eat the bodies, and no one seems to care. No more sausages in the apocalypse. <laughs> Unexplained noises keep happening here. Unexplained everything keeps happening here. May have been a bad idea coming here. It's a place to go. It's a place where dialogue and stage directions might happen. They are at the information center. Even though it doesn't really work anymore, you can still get information from it. And you can find out what apartment his brother lives in, who he hasn't seen in 12 years. So much walking, just walking and walking and walking. Can you see the three? Shouldn't we help him? He's gonna freeze to death. He already has. There it goes. The big chance to have a three-person dialogue. I'm so tired of walking. We're so tired of you walking. Essex goes to see his brother, Francia. Come in, we have a fire. Oh, la di da, Mr. Rich Guy with his fire. <laughs> Will I find work here? Mostly uh, shoveling. People aren't having babies so much anymore because it's the end of the world. But Vivia, Essex's companion, is pregnant. It's cause for celebration. Kombucha! Kombucha? <laughs> Kombucha! All around! <laughs> Careful, you'll get one of those lumpy things in it. Some people <laughs> like it, but... Scooby. Hey. You know what we do when we're excited? We play quintet. How do you stay alive? We play. There's nothing left but the game. In the nuclear winter, only the nerds survive. <laughs> the gamers. You guys sit here, play the game. I, Essex, am going to go get some firewood. Is it treated? Treated with what? Respect. Is it treated with respect? Do you have any Newman's own firewood? I, I prefer that line of products. They're enjoying some Alpo. That guy's name was Al. Yeah. While he's out, this fella stops by, and he's got a thing. Look out, exploding thermos! Everyone is killed, including Vivia and the child. Essex sees the guy who did it. There is now a very sensibly paced chase scene. They're chasing each other at neck-safe speeds. <laughs> They run, and they run, and they run, until they get to a room with a big face. Ask the computer. The computer will give you the answers. There's the guy. I broke no womb. What? I said I got no womb. <laughs> you got no womb. Someone else kills him instead. He finds a list with these names on it. Gold Star, Redstone, and his brother Francia. Essex goes and gets his murdered wife. He doesn't want the dogs to get her. Hey, fellas, our DoorDash delivery is here. <laughs> he takes her to the river. He drops her in the water. And she floats away. Essex goes back to the directory. And tries to find Redstone. Redstone's not at home. Sometimes he stays at the Hotel Electra. You want to take turns napping, Matt? <laughs> we can go in like 10 minute stretches. Sleep in shifts. Yeah, and then I'll nudge you awake and it's like, <laughs> yeah, he's been walking. Essex goes there and gets a room. The woman who runs the place is Duca. She's on that list. I'm Duca. Duke, 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 Duke. Oh, cock die. Doesn't count. Cock die. Essex assumes the name of Redstone. Your room 243. Room 243. 243? 243! It's important enough for a close-up. Essex chills out in his chilly room. Boy, where's the air conditioner in this dump? It's gotta be 30 degrees in here. <laughs> Sweltering. And studies this list. What is it? Is this some sort of assassin's list? Are all these people gonna die? Housekeeping! Grigor bursts into the room. Oh, I, I thought this was my room. No, I'm just kidding. I knew it was your room, Redstone. You should come and play the game sometime. Essex, who's going as Redstone, meets Ambrosia. She's on the list. Gregor goes and chats with St. Christopher. He's on the list. There is an open seat at table number one. Hi, folks. It's me, a little baby boy. I hope you're enjoying the show. He gets pulled into the game. I always play the sixth man. I always play the sixth man in basketball. I get a lot of naps in. <laughs> yeah. So come, everybody. Put up the dead man. I am going to look up the rules to this game and learn it. And she wins the game. 
double one. That's what I call overkill. Congratulations, Ambrosia. You win nothing. <laughs> Essex has a room right next to Ambrosia, and that night, Gold Star shows up. Is St. Christopher trying to kill me? She doesn't know. I learned nothing from that. Essex goes to this weird church. Silas. 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 I like this guy. Silas. Oh, this is the extended remix. Yep. Silas. You know, sir, Silas is impossible while you're doing that. How life is basically nothing but a big quintet game. And we all die in the end. You wretched lives. In fact, are supremely happy because it is a pause, an interruption of the void preceding and following it. Meanwhile, Gold Star is busy being killed. Redstone! My homie! Essex goes to talk to Ambrosia about the game. Well, Gold Star is in bad mood. You can't go to sleep, friend. You need to watch this with me. I'm not going to stick this out on my own. They see the corpse. Ah, this is horrible. But luckily we have curtains. Trying to find a meaning where there is none. Death is arbitrary. You brought that from your old boss, Ingmar, uh, into this movie. Would you sleep here in my bed with me? Yes. It's unclear if they sleep together or just sleep together. <laughs> she thinks this is how it's done. She used to date Bergman, too. <laughs> she went from smiles of a summer night to cries of a winter fright. <laughs> the next morning, Essex is sneaking out of the room. Class act, Newman. And she's doing a weird thing. She's smiling. It's not common to see people smile. I dreamed about my mother. Oh. He slept here with me. He freaked me nasty. Maybe. The exactly jury's not in on that yet. Well, let's see what this set has to offer. I'm looking for St. Christopher. Hang on, St. Christopher on the passenger side. Open it up tonight, the devil can ride. Vogue. Hey, Redstone, let's have a drink together. Essex gets drunk. The scheme, you have to be part of it. So drunk that he can't walk himself home. Why don't you let St. Christopher take you back to your room? He lives in the hotel, room number... I know what room he lives in. I saw the close-up earlier in the movie. <laughs> hey, let's go to Denny's. Come on, I'll buy you a Grand Slam. <laughs> Puts him to bed. This isn't Redstone. Finds a razor. Essex knows what's going on. He's got his knife at the ready. Is there going to be a battle? No. Ambrosia goes to visit Duca, and Duca turns out to be... Deta. These six people who were picked at the beginning of the movie, they're playing a game of quintet. They're LARPing quintet. They're playing it in real space with real stakes. What happens next? Redstone is still out there. No, I killed Redstone. Essex has decided to play the game. He's our Redstone now. Essex is walking out on the tundra. St. Christopher goes to kill him. They're hunting each other down. Come on, call on the Hanson brothers! They're leading up to this mighty battle. No. St. Christopher is killed in a snow collapse. Well, that was easy now, wasn't it? I thought this was going to end with an anticlimax, and it's that. An anticlimax that is insulting to other anticlimaxes. Essex goes back to the city. Did you meet St. Christopher? He's dead. I killed him. Can Citation him needed. Now? Hey, what about the... <laughs> now you're dead. I've won. What's the prize? Winning. Being alive. Isn't that great? It is feeling the heat of the adrenaline. Don't you love the adrenaline running through your, your system? <laughs> I don't like it. I am out of here. Go north to follow a goose and do some walking. And oh, does he walk. Yeah, give us a the end. The end. Just the end. We know it's the end. Just end it. He doesn't need to walk anymore. We've seen him walk. He is walking in the distance. We know exactly where he's going. The end. End it. God damn it. <laughs> the end. Oh, there. A freeze frame ending.
Free swim ending! <laughs> this is what is maddening about Quintet. It could have been a good movie. It has all of the raw materials that a good movie has. This is a very bad, great movie. It's got the cast. It's got an interesting premise. The soundtrack is so strange and otherworldly, ritualistic. This is how a sci-fi movie should look The set and design feel. and the production design is stunning. I was feeling like the actors were in danger just by being there. When the characters finally start talking, a lot of the dialogue has a really kind of sublime poetry to yeah. it. Yeah. In a year, maybe even a month, all dying will be done. That's an amazing line. You'll never understand the scheme until you're part of the scheme. Yeah. The movie is such a failure. What it desperately needs is exposition. To having characters just blatantly explaining things. Explaining the game, that's what they needed. And if we would have had that, then we would be able to see how this real-life game of Quintet is being played. Oh, they even go into limbo at the end. That's got to mean something if you know how to play Quintet, which nobody knows how to play. And if they did explain that to us and the sound recording wasn't so lousy and we could actually hear and understand it, that would have been another improvement of the film. I yeah. think bad sound is a common flaw of Robert Altman films. And then we would be able to latch onto the movie a little bit stronger. And that's exactly what is impossible to do in the first 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to latch onto. Yeah. The movie holds the audience at an expanse yeah. of distance. Well, there is one thing that you latch onto. The pregnant woman. Oh, so this is the movie. No, it's not. <laughs> He's the only person there who has hope. Maybe we can breed still. What about that goose? We could be starting again. Joy in a joyless world. I think that's a theme of this. They don't smile anymore. They don't use the word friend. There aren't babies being born because I think people can't muster up the urge to make love. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think it's a, a children of men you epidemic sort of thing. Where just we've been radioactive right, and, and right. Our, all people, of our sperm died. People yeah. are just not doing anything. That's also where Quintet comes in. This is something we can do. We can't go out and build something. We can't have a farm. We can play this game, though. And we can construct this ideology about how this game is part of our lives and we're the game and the game is us. I think this game should be remade. I think this game. I think this movie should be remade, definitely. This yeah. would be a prime candidate. Like a Ridley Scott could take something and do something really extraordinary with this. And also, board games are more popular than ever these days. So yes. make a movie about a board game that actually means something. B.B. Mm -hmm. Anderson is a basement alum. She was in The Magician. Yep. The Blurry Lens. I think another bad choice. Imagine if Spike Lee and Crooklyn, you remember what he did with those scenes where mm -hmm. the aspect ratio? Imagine him doing that for the whole movie. I liked that look because it made it look unlike any other movie I've ever seen. I don't think it added anything to the visuals. It just added, oh, it's really blurry at the edges. This movie was called by Stanley Kaufman, who's a really amazing writer, Self-indulgent. Stanley Kaufman called it paralyzingly stupid. Oh, okay. Which I think is an even worse description. It's not stupid. It's, it's paralyzingly it's... intelligent. Yeah. That's the problem with it. Uh, yeah. It's so uh, smart, it's stupid. With, with an emphasis on the paralyzing. Yeah. Variety called it self-indulgent. Yeah. How is it self-indulgent? It's not this like is, Altman movies. This is the least Altman-esque Altman movie, so it doesn't seem self-indulgent self at all. Well, all of the pieces of Quintet have been taken off the board and put in the little box, and the game has been put away. And by game, I mean movie. And by put away, I mean we are done watching it and talking about it. And now it's time to play a little game called Seen It. Seen It. Brian Hines writes, Key Largo, a very tense and at times ugly film but full of great characters. Bogart as the hero in Need of Redemption and Robinson as the affable but ruthless mob boss all trapped in a hotel during a tropical storm. Seen it! Seen it! The thing I remember most is that Lauren Bacall mm -hmm. is there and Robinson whispers in her ear. You can tell he's just whispering filthy things and she's just... It's a really great way to illustrate the vileness of this character <clears throat> totally cleanly. You don't really need to hear the worst thing you've ever heard. Because the worst thing you've ever heard is in your brain. Yeah. Golden Spider Duck writes, Carnal Knowledge. Good lord, that movie is good. I've seen it. Seen it, yeah. For people who think that toxic masculinity is a new concept, this is the most toxic representation of characters. Yes, done. and yeah. it's 50 years old. Two of the mathematical equations of toxic masculinity are commitment equals emasculation mm -hmm. and conquest equals fulfillment. Yeah. This is how 
Jack Nicholson's character lives his life. Living a life by these principles leads to the ultimate state of emasculation, which is in that final scene with mm-hmm. Rita Moreno, which is a scene beyond belief. Yeah. And he's basically this impotent sex junkie because he approaches relationships with women wanting them to fill him up yeah. and make him a complete person, but unwilling to give anything of himself. A lot of people can look at Anne Margaret as kind of a sex symbol and not an actress. She kills it in this movie. And Candace Bergen, she is so alive and vibrant. There's a scene where she's out with the boys and she's laughing. I, know. I love that scene. The two guys, Nicholson and Garfunkel, I, I really hesitate to call them monstrous or mm-hmm. monsters. They sort of grew up sideways. Mm-hmm. They aged, but they never evolved. And they never really learned who they were. Yeah. Maybe the problem is that they met each other. Robert James Cole, Disappearance at Clifton Hill. It has a great cast with Tuppence Middleton in the lead role of a woman who's trying to unravel a mystery. And David Cronenberg in a supporting role as a conspiracy theorist podcaster. Seen it. Not seen it. There's something really unique about Canadian cinema. It all seems to have a common temperature. It's all very cold and very flat. And I don't say that in a critical way. I say that in a textural way. Yeah. It almost seems to hold the audience at a distance rather than bring them in. Yeah. And yet it still works. Disappearance at Clifton Hill is no exception. Neither is movies like Scanners or the films of Vincenzo Natale or that weird Don McKellar thing that you showed me 15 years ago. I think it's because all of their movies are very low budget. It's basically that they are trapped in the early 90s. We're basically an indie film country. You never hear about the $50 million Canadian movie. No, you don't. MJS Cool 2, The French Dispatch, the most Wes Anderson-y movie yet. Seen it. Seen it, you silly goose. Uh, we saw it in the theater together. And I saw it in the theater a second time with Tona. Just give him the Oscar. One of the top two. Just give it to him. If we don't, he'll become Terry Gilliam, or he'll become uh, Tim Burton, and no one will ever think about giving them an Oscar ever again. He is doing things no one else has ever conceived. Seeing it a second time is not a recommendation. It's a requirement. Yeah. I was shocked at how much I missed the first time. I missed the entire reason that Nescoffier, the police chef, was famous. I didn't get any of that because while Jeffrey Wright was telling us that, he was walking through all these different rooms where pugilism (laughs) and target practice was happening. And I just couldn't absorb it all. I read an article saying the world has become Wes Andersonized. If you look at commercials, they're just basically making little Wes Anderson movies. No one is going to follow me anymore. No one is going to copy the French Dispatch because no one can. He's Jesse Owens. Yeah. He takes highbrow art and he makes it cool and he makes it sexy and he makes it funny. And occasionally he makes it vulgar and low. And this is really art house cinema for the masses. Mm -hmm. This is a movie that I can't imagine the most jaded millennial not enjoying this movie. I wish it to become famous enough where a pinball machine company comes out with a modern physics Pinball machine. I will pay whatever they're asking, and that will be in my house. I don't know what he's talking about. I don't remember modern physics. you got to see it again. I have to see it again. <laughs> is there anything as fun as playing quintet? I think there is. It's going to our website, welcometothebasementshow.com. You can go there and watch all of our episodes. That's a fun thing to do. And another thing to do is to click the PayPal donation buttons and support our show with a one-time or rolling monthly donation. Yes. A couple of one-time donors are Olivia, a nice little generous donation there. And Laura, who says, For Jeff, my husband and father of our twin girls, that makes me watch clips to learn what I didn't know I needed to know. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you, Laura. And all of you. If you want to see these two crazy cut-ups continue with their chit-chat, you can watch Unboxing, which comes out this coming Friday. If you are missing out on some basement holiday cheer, you can check out our Christmas playlist, which features all of our holiday-related episodes from the past 10 years. It's at the end of this video. Our next episode will be our end-of-the-year megasode. We have a show that's less traditional. Normally, that would come out two weeks from now, but that's going to be Christmas Eve, and so we're going to take that night off. Instead, the show will come out on New Year's Eve. 
Lorenzo's fifth birthday. Hey, look at that. Thanks for watching Quintet, and now watch this. Please. <laughs> what game are you going to play? You hunter of cheese! Huh? You hunter of cheese, huh? <laughs> you will not find cheese! There are no milk-bearing mammals near here! An hunter of seals. It is feeling the heat of the adrenaline.